And uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. And this is quite an honor. Um, I appreciate the invitation. Uh, we talked about several different topics for this uh, lecture and came up with children's trauma. I've been at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia for about 25 years, uh, do a lot of trauma and spine and tumor work, but it's really the trauma that um, is something that I've been interested in the entire way, and it's, I learned a lot preparing this lecture about the global burden. For those of you who are not um, pediatric orthopedic surgeons and are not uh, students of the history of medicine, the word orthopedics arises from the Greek, uh, the straight child, orthos is straight, pedios child. Uh, Nicholas Andre coined that term. He was a Parisian physician who specializes in posture. He would teach people to have good posture, and his book, uh, Orthopedia, contained the tree of Andre, and I'm sure all of you um, are familiar with that story, but it's really the origin of what we do. The facts relating to the burden of children's trauma are summarized in this slide. Children's injuries are a major public health issue. Trauma is a leading cause of death for older children and young adults. Over 90% of the injuries to children are the result of unintentional or accidental uh, incidents or trauma. And even in the high-income countries where there's been a reduction in child injury deaths, it's still up uh, to 50 percent over the past decades, injuries still account for 40 percent of the deaths in these countries. So even with the improvement, it's still quite a problem. And that's in the best of uh, situations. Uh, globally, it's a leading cause of death between the ages of uh, 10 and 19 years. Uh, Ninety-three percent of child road traffic deaths are from low- and middle-income countries. Um, which is imp impressive and sobering. And about two-thirds of children's road traffic injury deaths occur in Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific region. The Lancet did a nice job of summarizing the burden of disease. This was published in Lancet, but it was the work of multiple organization, organizations shown in this uh, slide, including the World Health Organization, um, University of Washington, the World Bank, and this was a seven uh, systems analysis of data um, published. And in that, you can see this is the, the um, uh, pictorial representation of the burden of disease in general with um, the green being injury, the red being infectious disease, and on your left, the blue being um, congenital anomalies and other health issues. And if you play this forward over three periods of time. They looked at this in 1990, in 2000, and then in 2010. And you can see the changes occurring, and I'm going to move back to 1990. Here you can see the darker the color and the bigger the box, the more burden that there is. And you can see in the top, the green part is um, representative. But with time, as you move 10 years further, there's an increase in disaster. And you can see in the bottom an increase in HIV. And as you fast forward another 10 years, you can see there's still problems with disaster increasing, road injury, uh, falls, traumatic injury, and HIV in the bottom and the infectious red section has increased further. So this is really the best information we have on the burden of disease, and it's far from perfect, but it represents all of the disease and injury uh, known to mankind, and they're trying to get a handle on how it's changing as a function of time. And they also looked at this by region of the world. And in this slide, the highest numbers are dark red, uh, less is light red, and the lowest numbers of a disease burden are light blue. And again, you can see we're looking at deaths by injury uh, in the age 5 to 14 years in 1990. And as you move forward, you're seeing in 10 years, from 1990 to 2000, we see a major improvement in India and parts of Africa, but worsening of the situation in China. Fast forward another 10 years, these are deaths w due to injury in children, and you see major improvements in the subsequent 10 years. And this, again, is the best available information, which is parenthetically far from perfect. You can look at the same thing in terms of specific road traffic injuries, not deaths, but injuries. Here we are in 2000. Uh, for deaths due to road traffic injuries, we see major problems in Africa and problems elsewhere. Uh, and then the, moving forward 10 years, minimal improvements, uh, no improvement in most of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and then 
Finally, these are deaths by firearms, for deaths due to firearms in 2000, big problem in Africa and India. Fast forwarding 10 years, only moderate improvements in the last 10 years. Most affected countries, again, being portions of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the rest unchanged. So the deaths have decreased over the last 20 years, as shown in that first series of slides and illustrated geographically, but there's more disability from trauma uh, for older children. So more children than ever are living in the burden of disability. Injury is by far the most common cause of death in older children. You can see the dark blue in this bar graph and it increases with age. Males are two times more likely than females to die from road traffic injuries as illustrated in this slide and that's not hard to understand why. And I was impressed to read this, of, the, of only 28 countries in the world representing only 7% of the world's population have adequate laws that address all five risk factors for road traffic injuries, being speed, drunk driving, helmets, seat belts, and child resistance. And this uh, is not a good situation. So prevention is really uh, what we all aim for. Ben Franklin said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So Sir William Oshler, prevention is the pinnacle of a physician's art, um, but late treatment is what we do most often. The public health approach to understanding prevention is to, in box one, define the problem, then in box two, what are the causes, box three, what works, and then number four, which is where we stumble the most, how to implement or execute the changes that will lead to improvements. For road traffic uh, accidents, what can be done? These are the things that have been proven to work, um, and it's outlined on this slide by minimizing um, or, or maximizing the drinking age laws, uh, providing helmets, child resistance, uh, uh, seats and helmet laws, et cetera, et cetera. There are things that do reduce the burden from road traffic injury. Um, so the major takeaway points, child injuries are, are a major public health issue. Uh, injury directly affects the survival of children and can, be, and it can be prevented. The cost of doing nothing is more than the cost of doing something. Very few countries have good data on child injury and, and few countries have good laws in place. Uh, and globally, there are too few practitioners in child injury prevention. So the advances for orthopedic surgeons in the, in the trauma world, we all treat children and adults with trauma. What things have changed that have improved our ability to provide good care? For surgery, it really relates to the development of the trauma team. We have a, a multiple uh, members of this team as listed, including the surgeons. We have emergency medicine, physicians, anesthesiologists, clinical care, uh, doctors, radiologists, PM&R specialists, and others who help us with this care. And we also have learned a lot about the importance of the, go the golden hour, not only for adults, but also for children. Uh, we've seen advancements in the designation of trauma centers, and this article came out earlier this year uh, and really was an important article um, in defining um, the value of having a well-resourced trauma center. And to make a long story short, this article in the American College of Surgeons classified uh, surgical trauma care in the United States for children into three levels, with level one being the highest, level two uh, being middle, middle resourced or middle able facilities, and then level three facilities that really aren't able probably to do such a great job. And this, Classification and ranking encouraged or provoked a lot of discussion and encouraged competition and discussion for improvement. So there's also the uh, evolution and better understanding of the importance of trauma registries. I think this is an effect, this accepted fact as to how important it is to track this information and track your results. There's other um, efforts in uh, North America and elsewhere to understand the needs of the patients, the outcomes. Uh, NISQIP is an uh, uh, effort that's very valuable in, in ranking and scoring results. And we're all learning a lot from that. And I think at the individual institution level, there are many programs that are developing trauma prevention uh, efforts, which is very, very important. And we live in this age of globalization where we have the internet, telecommunications, uh, rapid communication, and we have access to knowledge and information. And this, I think, is we're all working towards the same 
goals, and it's easier and easier to improve and develop and move forward and implement these things. But there is this gap. We just uh, had a symposium uh, the last hour on the gap between resources in, in many different parts of the world. And there's a, a gap of medical standards of care um, that is difficult to address. Um, it's a uniform problem. Trauma is a uniform problem with a variable presentation. Um, globalization is a process of uh, integration and interchange, and I think working together to share best practices is certainly one of the answers. And as being a high-tech, modern orthopedic surgeon, surgeon, we sometimes need to look back at the principles. And I wanted to include some of the basic principles of pediatric uh, trauma and long bone fracture management. And this is essentially in the last 10 years what has evolved, I think, uh, globally is the principles of pediatric fracture management. Number one, the importance of understanding remodeling. Um, children will remodel significantly, and the, uh, if the angulation is in the axis of the joint, it will remodel better. The younger the age, et cetera, et cetera, it's important to understand how that can help you. Uh, knowing the operative fractures, there are certain fractures that require an operation, certain fractures where the child will do better with an operation, as shown with this lateral condylar fracture. If treated conservatively when a, with a cast, that will often go on to a non-union. Number three, knowing when non-operative treatment is the standard of care. Uh, almost, distal, almost all distal radius fractures, most diaphyseal forearm fractures, especially under age 10 years, humeral shaft fractures, clavicle fractures, femur and tibia fractures in the very young and most pediatric pelvic fractures. Number four, mastering non-operative management, being able to apply and remove casts and, and do it in a safe and effective way to control the fracture, recognizing complications, especially compartment syndrome. Uh, warning the patient about overgrowth, knowing what can go wrong and knowing appropriately how often these uh, complications occur so you can instruct the patient and family. Number six, knowing when the kid's fractures become an adult fracture. Generally, after age eight to ten, most of the fractures we treat are treated uh, as you would an adult uh, fracture. So these guidelines and principles can be very helpful. Number seven, knowing when there's a high risk for a growth arrest. The distal femur the, uh, and, and also the distal ulna have a high risk for growth arrest. And know where the uh, growth arrest risk is low, especially the distal radius and other sites. Number nine, uh, the injury may look bigger than it appears on the plane radiograph. Remember the radiograph is a shadow of the bones at a point in time and there's a lot of growth cartilage and other cartilage that can be damaged and with the plane radiographic appearance it may not look that bad. And number 10, don't forget non-accidental trauma or child abuse. This is something we always need to keep in the forefront and recognize when it occurs. Uh, recent advancements in pediatric musculoskeletal uh, care, uh, non-operative treatment has always been the gold standard, but in the recent decade or so, there has been a shift towards operative treatment for selected patients, uh, both bone forearm fractures and patients over 10. And especially there's a, an evolving uh, demonstration of the financial benefit in certain situations and environments for patients and families and the healthcare system. Uh, as pediatric orthopedic surgeons, we're using more titanium elastic nails or enders rods, simple IM rods to stabilize these fractures. This can be cost effective. Um, and then the, the evolution of percutaneous pinning of supracondylar or distal humerus fractures, I think, is an accepted standard of care. It's safe and it's, in most environments, the best way to achieve good results. Not the only way, but in many situations, the best way. And then uh, instrumentation and stabilization for uh, major fractures, such as unstable three-column spine fractures and unstable pelvis fractures. So those are the principles. It's good to remember the principles. Um, the burden is real. Uh, can individuals influence global trauma care? Can societies or groups like CCOT influence global trauma care? Um, this is a picture of uh, Ernest Codman. He was an orthopedic surgeon in Boston at about the turn of the century, the early 1900s, and he was really the father of outcomes medicine. He began the discussion and began to push for the importance of studying the results of surgical intervention. And 
one person with a strong voice and a clear message made a huge difference that lasts to this day. Relating to pediatric uh, trauma, there are many people in our field who have made a huge difference. Many of you in the audience know Kay Wilkins, and he's, Kay's been all over the world teaching, lecturing, providing care. And I think he's been a, a role model or mentor to many of us through the years as to how to do this. So we all tend to live in a box. We go to the office, we go to the hospital, we go home, we have our other activities, but sometimes it's good to think outside of the box and uh, push outside of the box. This is one of my associate surgeons at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, David Spiegel, who many of you know, uh, and he has made tremendous differences uh, throughout the world trying to uh, push for reduction in trauma care, prevention, um, care in the developing world, and has made a, a big difference with that. Um, taking your family when you go um, and help provide care is, is, a, is a big uh, plus that can help quite a bit. Starting a nonprofit, this is Lynn Staley's global help organization um, that has led to the teaching of pediatric uh, orthopedic fracture care and has been very valuable for those around the world. Lou Zirkel's uh, Surgical Implant Generation Network, manufacturing and teaching the manufacturing and distribution of low-cost implants. He was one of the early ones to do this beginning 25 years ago. Uh, what individual influence uh, can occur in a, a, with global trauma? Uh, World Orthopedic Concern has been in place for many, many years. We just spent the last hour and a half uh, discussing uh, having a symposium um, as to how World Orthopedic Concern and its uh, affiliate organizations can make an impact. Uh, this is Mike Lawrence, the current WOC president, and he's worked with Tan Slosser to re-engineer, revitalize, and improve this organization. We're trying to find tangible ways and efforts that we can uh, move forward and get involved. So individuals can make a difference. Um, uh, probably the best story that I know is uh, Roger Sakharin, who's here in the, the front row, um, and his colleagues in India recognizing the problem, understanding the burden of disease, uh, getting involved at the state level where progress was made, and then through his role with the Indian Orthopedic Association, pushing change nationally that is now paying benefits, coming to fruition, and making a huge impact, and I would propose that Raj is going to have made more of a difference with his life through this project than the other patient care activities that all of us do on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you think outside of the box and have a goal and find a, a, a project or a way to make a difference, it can, it can pay dividends. So individuals can make a difference, um, and again, to reiterate from the earlier slide here at the bottom, only 28 countries representing 7% of the world's population had adequate laws to address uh, five risk factors for uh, trauma care. So that changed in India through the efforts of one uh, individual. CCOT has made great strides, and it's been fun for me through the years to learn more about CCOT and its diversity and uh, geographic influence. Um, 110 member nations, uh, 60 ortho 63 orthopedic societies, uh, more than 200,000 orthopedic surgeons uh, involved worldwide. And to see the changes that have occurred recently with uh, electronic learning, um, uh, video teleconferencing, web um, webinars, um, CCOT is moving strongly into the new age and reaching and touching people and influencing education and hopefully prevention through um, its efforts. And I'm not going to reiterate the many activities of uh, CCOT and particularly its education uh, committee work under the leadership of Ashok Johari. It's impressive all the many things that are happening on many, many different fronts and you can see this uh, incomplete list of, of all of this. And the other impressive thing uh, is the leadership's uh, vision through the decades of reaching out to other organizations, not trying to recreate the wheel, but reaching out to organizations where there is the infrastructure uh, and a pattern and record of success. Uh, uh, it's very impressive uh, to see that. And if you look back into the CCOT Constitution, uh, all of these things are mentioned, including um, uh, prevention. Um, so back to prevention, I think it's something that 
we all need to um, push and strive for and find models that have worked and try and move forward. So can CCOT influence global pediatric trauma care? Um, we need to, uh, let me go back, support and grow our outreach programs. We need to reinforce our funding opportunities and promote interventions and evaluation of child injury preventions. And the CCOT Foundation parenthetically is moving forward, I think, uh, with an effort to uh, raise some meaning, meaningful um, funds in the, in the form of endowments to sustain an ongoing effort, um, build ongoing regional approaches, and that's been done well, continue to strengthen our relationships with other groups that serve the same goals as ours, and ex finally expand and utilize CCOT's reach through advocacy, education, and research. And this is the board of directors. Uh, I had the privilege of working with these people through my role in the CCOT Foundation, and I think every one of these individuals uh, is committed to um, prevention, inclusiveness, uh, global diversity, uh, education, and making tremendous progress. Uh, and I'm confident that that will happen within this organization. Thank you very much.